please. <coughs> okay, uh, so first of all, we want to be able to identify uh, driver mutations, and in particular, we would like to know uh, which mutations were gain of function and loss of function um, in order to better understand disease mechanism and, and treatment. Um, there are many mutations out there that we don't know much about. Uh, they tend to be these lower prevalence mutations, but they're very much recurrent. And I'm going to talk about a method that I've been developing uh, to infer gain of function and loss of function using an integrated pathway approach. Um, to, as a quick introduction to Paradigm, what Paradigm does is it takes in functional genomics data such as copy number expression as well as sets of pathways uh, in order to infer uh, gene level activities. And uh, kind of a quick example, if we were to infer higher activity of say MDM2 with expression data and a copy number, we would therefore predict uh, less activity for P53. And loss of function and gain of function in, in terms of pathways, kind of what we would expect is that for loss of function events, there, the genes regulating it might be active and trying to uh, turn up its activity, but downstream, the, the gene's not functional, so the downstream targets are off. And the opposite would be true in the case of a gain of function. Um, so I'm working on, a, my approach is called discrepancy analysis for now, but what it does is it tries to leverage the difference between the, the signal up, upstream to downstream in order to infer these mutations. And the way I do that is I run Paradigm in two modes, one where I run it based on the downstream information and one uh, with upstream, and then I infer a discrepancy between the activities. Uh, now I'm going to give an example of a, a real mutation, RB1 and GBM. This is a loss of function mutation, and uh, sh this is a circle plot, and what it's showing is that the center ring uh, shows you with the black ticks, those are uh, mutated samples of RB1, and uh, the rings outside of those expression, the inferred upstream activity by paradigm, the inferred downstream activity by paradigm, and then the discrepancy score, which is just the difference between the inferred downstream and upstream activity. And what you, what you will notice is that when RB1 is mutated, paradigm is inferring uh, higher activity in the mutated uh, case uh, for the upstream information, but downstream it's inferred that it's inactive. And this leads to a negative uh, discrepancy score tracking with the mutations. Uh, now if you want to go back to the original data, um, I'm showing the network used to infer this RB1 mutation. Uh, if you look upstream, RB1's activators, such as CDKN2A through C, are more active uh, in the mutant case, and the inhibitors are less active. So you can see uh, the, the more red tracking uh, CDKN2A with the black and uh, the opposite for, say, CD, CD, C, CCND2 and downstream we're inferring uh, a lower activity. Uh, so now for each sample we have computed a discrepancy score, uh, but we have two populations, the mutant case and the non-mutant samples. Uh, showing the discrepancy scores between the two groups, you can see there's a pretty significant difference in the discrepancy scores for the mutant and the non-mutant samples. Uh, shown in red are the mutant samples. So a, a more negative, uh, discrepancy score is more indicative of a loss of function. Uh, that I compute a T statistic between the two distributions, and that's what I'm calling a signal score. Uh, the next thing you want to ask is, now, now that I've called a possible loss of function, how significant is this signal score? Um, and to ask that question, what I do is I have a background model in which I'm keeping the same network topology, but permuting the genes used to infer the mutation. So, the network is the same, except the, the data provided uh, is, is permuted out of all the 20,000 genes in the data set. And given this background model run uh, this time, this shown here is for 100 times, uh, I have a background distribution of signal scores, and I compute, uh, compare my observed value against it, and it's, it's pretty significant uh, for, as an, a loss of function call. 
Now I'm going to show an, another example, but this time uh, a gain of function of NFE2L2 uh, or NERF2 in uh, lung squamous cell cancer. And uh, this time you see that there's higher downstream activity tracking with the mutations, and that leads to a, a positive discrepancy score. Shown here is the, the, the NERF2 network. Uh, you can see KEEP1 it, it normally uh, aids in the degradation of NFE2L2, uh, but um, it's, it's more active in, in the mutant case, and it's, it's not uh, uh, in repressing NERF2 because you can see that downstream, such as NQO1, the, the expression readout is quite strong tracking with the mutations. Again, when you look at the, the difference between the two distributions of discrepancy scores for the non-mutant and the mutated samples, uh, there's a pretty significant uh, difference between the two. And again, with the background model, it's, it's very significant. So the next thing I want to do is show that my approach was both uh, sp sp uh, sensitive as well as specific. And in order to do this, I, I ran on a set of potential passenger mutations uh, from colorectal cancer. And the way I selected those genes was I, I used um, genes that had mutsig Q values greater than 0.5. And it turns out since uh, those genes actually aren't that well annotated in our pathways, there were four, four genes that had enough pathway information to run my analysis on. And shown here is one of them. Uh, PRKDC, and you can see there isn't a significant difference between the discrepancy scores of the non-mutated and the mutated samples. Uh, so in order to uh, summarize my method, I've, sh I've shown that discrepancy analysis can uh, differentiate between gain of function and loss of function mutations using uh, pathway information uh, and I've also shown that this works in the case of RB1 and, G and GBM and, and NERF2 and lung squamous, as well as showing uh, a negative control. Well, so this, this approach c has potential in that if we can potentially ad identify gain of function mutations by running uh, my analysis on all uh, mutations in a cancer cohort, uh, if we identify novel gain of functions, this could uh, provide insight for drug treatment. Yeah. And actually that went pretty quick. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for some questions. Chris? Uh, there's a gain of function, loss of function. There's an interesting subclass, perhaps a minority, which are switch of function. Right. IDH1, IDH2 actually is a very nice example of that. Can you extend your method to get at those? Uh, potentially, on a that might be able to be done on a on case by case. I it, it would be difficult to do a switch of function since um, we run our analysis on fixed pathways that we have annotations for. So predicting a switch of function would be difficult. Please. So a very interesting approach. Um, did I catch you right, or did you say that all but four of the genes that are uh, annotated in one of the net in your paradigm networks, or the networks that are inputs to paradigm, had a Q value of less than 0.5? Greater than. Uh, uh, so our pathways are fairly cancer enriched. Uh, so I mean, well, not well studied genes that will have not significant p values in uh, mute sig are less likely to be on our pathways. And we're always uh, expanding our pathways to include more genes. So later, our coverage may be greater. So do you think that just represents some kind of literature bias, or, right. or that's actual biology that you're discovering? Um, it, it most likely a literature bias. Our pathways uh, currently have about 25% of the genome. Linda? Uh, if I understand you correctly, you are co collapsing all the mutation on one gene and consider it as a whole in 
assessing whether it's a gain or loss function or neutral event. Um, is, is that true? What, what do you mean exactly by collapsing? Well, m most of the mutations we see are not hotspot. You know, always oh, exactly oh, okay. the same mutation right. in a gene. So are you collecting all the mutation that occurs on a gene right. and treat them as one entity in, in your analysis? Right. So all the mutations that are not um, silent mutations, right. I'm collapsing them together in this analysis. But you could potentially imagine that I could split up mutations by their different domains as well and, and just run them separately. I can treat them as separate mutations. I, I think that would be useful because they're certainly um, a lot of, not a lot, enough functional data to show that different amino acid changes in the same gene can have opposing effects. Right. I completely agree. Thank you. Nice talk. Uh, so when you're calculating this discrepancy score, are you differentiating between activating or inhibitory relationship that a gene might have with its downstream Right. Partners? So the, the paradigm model uh, can handle activating and inhibiting links. So, I mean, the logic is just kind of switched. When you see, an, an, uh, in the case of RB1, I was showing that RB1 had uh, inhibitors, and you can see that the logic is switched for those genes. Um, uh, when uh, the RB1 was mutated, uh, those repressors were um, less active. Right. Sam, I wonder if you could comment on why the distribution of the discrepancy scores in the mutated samples is bimodal. In, in, in RB1, I, you noticed that. Well, I think in both. It oh, okay. In, I think it was in both. But in RB1, it was more, pr more pronounced. OK. One possible explanation is though that mutation could have been a silent mutation, even though, I mean, it could have been a neutral mutation, even though it was uh, not silent. OK. Thank you. OK. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.